I'd like to acknowledge uh, all these people who have contributed to the work that I'm going to present. And I'm going to present this lecture in reverse order. It says microstructural engineering and crystallographic texture. First, I'm going to talk about crystallographic texture. And then I'll show you how that is used in creating a novel industrial application which is already being used. Okay. So I disagree with uh, Niels Hansen about universities doing basic work and industry doing industrial applications. Okay. Uh, institutes. Okay. Uh, steels are very complicated and that's the reason why they are very interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a myriad of transformations. Okay. Here I'm illustrating just a few. There are thousands of different kinds of transformations we can call upon. Uh, the main transformations you can divide into two parts. Reconstructive transformations which require a lot of diffusion and displacive transformations which occur by a deformation of the parent structure into the product lattice. And I'm going to focus on this part of the phase field. Uh, bainite, Wiedmann-Staden ferrite, martensite, etc. And we want to predict the transformation texture. Uh, this is the Bain deformation. Uh, we have here the blue is the austenite, two unit cells of austenite put together. Inside that you can identify a body centered tetragonal cell of austenite, which if I compress along this axis and expand along these two axes, gives me the body centered cubic cell of ferrite. Okay, so this is 1924 Bain, the deformation which changes the lattice. However, it's a mistake to think this is the total story because if this was the total story, you would never get a displacive transformation in steel. The strain energy is just too large. There is no coherency at all with the Bain deformation. The proper story was set out in 1953-54 by Bolt, McKenzie and Wexler, Lieberman and Reed and it's too complicated to go into here, uh, to, in today's lecture, but in addition to the Bain strain, you have a rigid body rotation which produces a single invariant line, a, a coherent line between the austenite and the ferrite, which is the minimum condition for martensitic or displacive transformation. If you do not get a single coherent line, it's impossible to get martensitic transformation because it requires the glissile movement of an interface. In addition, uh, there is a, another deformation known as a lattice invariant deformation which completely changes the Bain strain and the rigid body rotation into what's known as an invariant plane strain, rather like mechanical twinning. It leaves one plane completely unchanged and undeformed. And this is what an invariant plane strain looks like. This is an atomic force microscope image of austenite which was polished completely flat, allowed to transform to bainite and you see these large deformations accompanying the formation of bainite. And the same applies to martensite and Wiedmannstadt and ferrite. The deformation is characterized like this, that if this is my austenite, when the transformation happens, you get a large shear deformation. Okay, so that is much, much larger than any elastic strain you, you can think about. Elastic strain is of the order of 10 to the minus 3, and a dilatation which is normal to this plane here. So it's not an isotropic dilatation, it's normal to the invariant plane. So that's the physical deformation from phase transformation. Now, of course, when we have a polycrystalline material, the shears will happen in many directions because the grains are differently oriented and they will cancel out on average and you will get a change in shape in going from here to here, which is like so, just a volume change. Okay. Even though the shears are happening, they mutually cancel out in general. However, if you bias the microstructure somehow, then, of course, you pick up the shear strains because you are forming non-random variants. Okay. So by biasing the microstructure, you can pick up this large shear strain and make use of it in cancelling various features of phase transformations, which I'll come to in the second half of the talk. If you do this, then there is a possibility that you can get up to 15% elongation just from phase transformation. Okay? So that's the upper limit of elongation. And just to show you that this is real, this is uh, a case where we have random formation of plates of martensite 
and this is a case, uh, sorry, bainite, and this is a case where we transform under an external stress, and you can see clear bias in the microstructure relative to the stress orientation. So this is a real effect which you can pick up in the microstructure or you can pick up by measuring dimensions in all three orientations. Now, we have to distinguish displacive transformations from the other transformations for another reason. You know, in order to define an interface, there are five degrees of freedom, okay? Three degrees of freedom are used up in the orientation relationship, okay? The axis and angle of rotation requires three degrees of freedom. So that just defines the orientation of crystal one relative to crystal two. The interface plane, you require another two degrees of freedom, the normal to the interface, to define the interface plane, because I can alter the interface plane without changing the orientation relationship. Now, this is not the case for displacive transformations. Once you have picked the orientation relationship, the shape deformation, the interface plane is automatically fixed. Okay? So, the important thing is that the characteristics of a displacing transformation are all mathematically connected. So, here, for example, is the orientation relationship. Here is the interface plane. And this is the shape deformation. These are uniquely related. You cannot use these quantities independently. Second point I'd like to make is that orientations like Kojimov, Sachs, and Nishiyama, Vasman simply don't exist because they do not produce an invariant line between the austenite and ferrite. When you do precise measurements, there will be a very, very small angle between this and this. So they are not parallel. And you know, the work that Inomoto has done assumes that to be parallel. So they start with an assumption of orientation relationship. Uh, so the actual orientation relationship and interface plane are irrational, and very accurate measurements have been done to demonstrate that over many, many years. So, in order to define a particular plate of martensite, bainite, or Weidmann sand ferrite, you need this information, and it is uniquely related by the crystallographic theory of martensite. Now, how do we get variant selection in such circumstances? Uh, well, when we strain a single crystal, how do we determine which is the plane on which the shear is going to happen by slip? We use the Schmidt law, which says, you know, the system which will operate will be the one with the largest resolved shear stress in the shear direction. Exactly the same applies here. You treat the transformation as a mechanical deformation, and you resolve your applied stress normal to the plane on which the Martin side forms and along the direction of shear, and you work out a mechanical driving force which will complement the chemical driving force. And in those cases where the transformation strain complements the stress, you will favor that variant. Where the transformation opposes the stress, that variant will have a lesser chance of forming. So there's a very clearly defined criterion for variant selection. Now, of course, uh, what we want to do is, uh, for, for an industrial application that I'll discuss later, is not simply to calculate the texture, but also the strains in all directions, okay? Um, so, supposing this is an austenite grain, and I define a vector u here, and this is the uh, region where a plate of martensite forms, then that vector u will be deformed into another vector, which will be, uh, you know, this average vector here, V. You can use this basic equation, this is the shape deformation due to martensite, to determine this vector, the new orientation of the vector U. And of course, you can do this for a polycrystalline material and for any number of austenite grains, and you get the transformation strain along any direction uh, by simply taking the final length divided by the original length of the vector. So it looks complicated, but it's very simple if you just think about a single martensite plate forming and deforming that vector and working out where the new vector lies. Polycrystalline with thousands of different plates of martensite, then you have to do that calculation for all those plates, which is just a trivial repetition of the same thing. So this is what you end up with finally, and you do that for 24 crystallographic variants in each grain, or less if there is variant selection, and for any number of austenite grains. The great thing is that once you do this calculation, you don't just calculate the orientations of the plates, you also calculate 
the strains in any direction that you care to choose, the transformation strains. And they will not be isotropic, because as soon as you get variant selection, you are no longer cancelling out the shear strains, which are very large. So, in fact, you could measure texture by measuring the anisotropic strains. You wouldn't actually necessarily have to go to an X-ray experiment, but this is another parameter which you could use to measure crystallographic texture for displacive transformations. And just to show you that this works, uh, these are published data on the orientations of austenite, the Gauss orientation, the cube orientation, and these are the published experimental data on transformation of that austenite in stainless steel under an applied stress. And if you don't allow for variant selection according to that mechanical free energy, then you predict the wrong texture. If you compare this and this, you know, there's lots of missing intensity here. But when you allow those plates which interact favorably with the applied stress to form, you predict the correct texture here. And similarly, for the other orientation of austenite, if you allow all variants to form, you incorrectly predict the measured texture, and here you are. And of course, this is the macroscopic texture that we are measuring. You can also do microscopic texture in individual grains and show that by using that variant selection criteria, you correctly predict the micro texture in an individual grain. Now, there is one, one problem with, uh, as far as I know, this exists in all texture theory, is that although we predict the orientations here, not actually predict the volume fractions of each variant. So this comparison is a bit misleading because these are intensities okay, of particular poles. These are simply the positions of those poles as predicted. We are not predicting that the fraction of this particular variant will be so much and the fraction of another variant will be so much. So this really is an unsolved problem. And at the moment what we are doing is using a bit of empiricism. What we did was we took lots of published data from the literature, calculated the mechanical driving force divided by the total driving force, which is the chemical free energy added to the mechanical driving force, and the variance selection depends on how large the mechanical driving force is with respect to the total driving force. You know, if the chemical driving force is large, it doesn't matter what stress you apply, you will get all variance forming. Okay, that's what this indicates, that when this ratio is very small, we will get all 24 variance forming. So at the moment, we use this straight line here as an empirical rule to determine the volume fractions, the probabilities with which particular variants will form, and then go on to intensity. Right, so let's apply this now. Uh, this is a, a very simple experiment known as a SATO test, where you take a tensile specimen at a, in the condition, and you physically train it. When it cools, you develop a stress because of thermal contraction and you also get plasticity, plastic deformation. So by the time you end up at room temperature, you've got a residual stress in your sample. So these are experiments done by Albury and Jones back in the 1970s. When you allow a phase transformation happen, uh, to happen, that phase transformation compensates for the stress. But as soon as you run out of phase transformation, it builds up again. So that's a bad thing if you want to avoid residual stresses. Now, if I show you the third curve, which is for martensite. Martensite transforms at a lower temperature than bainite. And therefore, um, is this behaving, sir? OK, I'll carry on. So martensite transforms at a lower temperature. So the transformation is exhausted at a lower temperature. And the final stress we end up with is smaller. Now, what we learn from this is that supposing we can get this point to come over here, then we would end up with zero residual stress. And that would have a major, major impact on welding of steels. Because, you know, when you design a steel structure and you join it up, you basically have residual stresses which are almost equal to the yield stress of the material. And you have to allow for that in your design calculations. Supposing we could weld a, material, weld a constrained assembly, and have zero residual stresses, that would be a big, big advantage from many points of view. 
our goal is to design a welding alloy which will automatically cancel out residual stresses by those transformation strains that I illustrated earlier. Now, of course, when you design a welding alloy, uh, it isn't just one thing that you have to optimize. You know, a weld has to be tough when it is deposited. There's no further heat treatment given to the weld. And many other criteria like strength, ductility, etc. So I won't go into all of those, but the toughness is very important because we want to go have the phase transformation occurring at a very low temperature. That means we are going to use martensite. Okay? If we use martensite, Welding people hate martensite, and we've got to demonstrate that we have a tough material. So these are calculations uh, which were done using a model for toughness, which I won't go into, which predicted some unusual features. That when I have a high combination of manganese and nickel, the toughness will decrease as I increase the nickel concentration. But when I have a low manganese and a high nickel concentration, the toughness actually improves. Okay? So we made uh, three different alloys here just to test this and sure enough when the manganese concentration is low and the nickel concentration is high we get the required toughness. The reason for this is that there is a new phase which appears when both of these elements are large which is a coarse phase. You can see the scale here and that's like putting a brick into the microstructure. You can get cleavage cracks right across that. Okay? So there's a physical reason why that calculation is correct. So let's assume that we've designed all the mechanical properties. Uh, using those calculations and transformation temperature calculations, we looked at two different alloys, welding alloys. Notice the large nickel concentration which suppresses the transformation temperature and we get a fully martensitic material. And this is a control experiment where the transformation temperature is high. It's a commercial electrode welding electrode. We then put these samples into a, a synchrotron at uh, Grenoble so that we can measure the development of stress as the sample actually cools and also monitor the fractions of transformations as a function of temperature and time. So it's basically a very fancy X-ray, high intensity X-ray equipment. And here, for example, you can directly get the amounts of martensite and, and ferrite as a function of temperature when a constrained sample cools. And this is the interesting part. Okay? So here, uh, this is the same sort of plot as the Albury plots that I showed you earlier, where we have a constrained sample at a high temperature. We are allowing it to cool under constraint and looking at what stress develops at room temperature. So if you first look at this control experiment here, we end up with a large residual stress inside our sample. That is not unexpected because the transformation gets exhausted here. If you look at this uh, blue color here, we end up with virtually zero stress at room temperature. And this is the second alloy, again, with zero stress. So these are welding materials which leave you with a zero stress. You can, of course, uh, also monitor the full set of stresses inside a real weld. So these are real welds and neutron diffraction experiments. This is the control experiment, and these are the, uh, this, this one is the designed alloy. And you can see here that uh, in the control experiment, we have a zero stress here and a compressive stress of minus 600 megapascals in the weld metal. So that's a compressive stress which means that you can actually apply a greater stress than you could if that was a tensile stress. So neutron diffraction measurements confirm that we can do this. We can actually use a welding alloy to cancel out residual stresses. Now, I would like to point out that uh, this is a particular design of a weld where we wanted to introduce a lot of constraints. So there's a single V notch here and nothing here. Okay? A real weld would penetrate the whole, whole of this sample. And we've still got to do a lot of work for multi-pass welds, which is what you would use commercially. But these electrodes are now being actually implemented to see whether, you know, with random fluctuations of stresses, you still have an advantage, etc. <coughs> Finished. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay.
kitchen is open for discussion. Uh, yes, in the back there is somebody. The other first person on the yeah. You have uh, told that uh, you are just going to biasing the microstructure. So, um, don't you think uh, it will uh, give some isotropic behavior in the mechanical properties? That's a good question. We haven't investigated that. But, you know, if you have thousands of austenite grains, I doubt if anisotropy will be a problem, but we haven't investigated that. Okay, thanks. Tony? nice uh, review of the situation. Your analysis of the strain associated with, or the transformation strain associated with the transformation implied that there was in fact a single orientation relationship and that what people observe is just scatter around that, that relationship. Am I interpreting your, yeah. your remarks correctly? Uh, you are interpreting them correctly. So, you know, the orientation relationship, the only uh, thing which will influence the orientation relationship is the lattice parameter ratio in the crystallographic theory. Sure. However, uh, as uh, John John has pointed out, these are displacive transformations and they cause plasticity in the austenite. So you will have that additional factor which is misorientations within the austenite which are not taken into account because I don't know how to do that. Talk to you afterwards. Yes, gentlemen. Your original aim was to uh, uh, make a weld which will have no residual stress. But in one of the examples, you showed that you actually landed up with a compressive stress. Correct. So what will be the implication, I mean, of this, of that compressive yeah. stress on uh, the final application? I'd like to end up with zero because, in fact, the stress system is not uniaxial. You know, it's, it's going in three dimensions. So if you have a compressive stress in one particular location, it may have a detrimental effect in another location. So ideally, I want to get to zero residual stress. You mentioned that the superimposition of mechanical stress with the chemical driving force, the select, controls the selection of the same boundary, uh, affect the, uh, yeah. in polycrystalline material, the selection of the... Uh, that's right. So that's a very good question. Now, I explained that in the case of a displacive transformation, the interface plane is not independent of the orientation relationship. So it's not like the normal, uh, you know, ferrite and perlite and so forth, where the interface can take any orientation depending on growth velocities and so forth. Here, the interface plane is actually constrained by the strain energy criterion. So it's not independent, it's not able to move. But your question is actually about the austenite grains, yeah? And that's a very good question because the nucleation of martensite happens from arrays of dislocations which are in the grain boundaries. And we know that some grain boundaries nucleate martensite plates more favorably than others. But unfortunately, I don't have the theory at this stage. Hmm. Yeah. In presence of deformation, the variant selection mechanism operates. Right. For example, if there is no, we are not putting external deformation, even then in presence of residual stress, some variant selection can operate. Absolutely. So, will it change because of the compressive stress or a tensile stress? Yes, uh, that is easy to take into account. So it's not just a single tensile stress or a compressive stress, but we can take account of a full stress tensor. It's, it's very easy to do that.